Good morning, church family. It is great to be here this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Awesome. My name is Garrett McCord. I'm the associate student pastor here, if you've not met me yet. Um, I do look a little bit different than last time I preached. I grew a beard because I was tired of being mistaken for one of our middle schoolers. Um, Okay, I'm glad y'all laughed. If y'all didn't laugh at that one, it was going to be a rough sermon for jokes, let me tell you. And so I'm sure you're wondering, why is there a fish tank up on the screen? Well, it is not because I just like to include fish tanks in my sermons. It is because I would like to tell you about an experiment this morning. And so years ago, when animal rights and and PETA and things like that weren't quite as actively campaigned as they were today, there was an experiment done using piranha. And what they did is they got this fish tank, this little square rectangular fish tank, and they stuck a glass divider in the middle of this fish tank. On one side, they put the piranhas, and then on the other side, they put some food. And so what happened is these piranhas would see the food, and they would try to swim to the other side of the tank, and they would bump their head and bump their head and bump their head, and eventually they would give up. And so what happened next, the next part of the experiment, is they removed that glass divider. And what do you think happened? Surprisingly, the piranha actually stayed in their side of the fish tank and starved to death even though they were free to swim over to the other side. Even though they were free from their captivity, they lived as if they weren't. And the reason that I bring up this experiment this morning is because this is often how we as believers can be with our sin. Think back, if you will, to uh, Pastor Jason's sermon a few weeks ago, right? We're going through every spiritual blessing and we learned that we are redeemed, that in Christ, We are cleansed from sin. We are free from its power to condemn us. Yet unfortunately, so many of us share the same situation as the piranha in that example. Even though we're free from our captivity to sin, we live as though we're not. We live as though we're trapped in the same place that we were before we knew Jesus. Still enslaved, never actually experiencing that freedom. And it's not supposed to be this way for us as believers, right? Yet we see it more and more in the headlines. Time and time again, another public Christian figure fails morally, right? You've heard it recently with the likes of Ravi Zacharias, John Chris, Carl Lentz. It's heartbreaking, right? And I don't know where those people stand with God, but it's clear that they were not living in the freedom that they seemed to have. And so this morning, um, none of us sitting here are Christian celebrities, right? But we're all faced with the same question. How do we actually go about walking out in the victory that we have gained through Christ? How do we go about walking out of sin in our lives? And this morning, we're going to answer that question using God's word. And so if you would, please flip with me to Romans 8, verses 11 through 13. That's where we're going to be this morning. And while you flip there, I need to give you some context, because especially with Romans, this this book acts as one cohesive argument. And so to understand what's going on in any one place in Romans, it really helps to know what comes before it. And so up to this point in Romans, Paul has been discussing where does our victory over sin come from? And so he, he eventually lands on the point that because Christ has died, so we have died to sin. And because Christ is raised, so are we are raised to walk in new life. And then he poses the question, well, should we continue in sin since we're, not, um, since we're, we're under grace now? Can we just keep on sinning? Of course not. That's not how God meant for it to be. And then in Romans 8, he begins to draw out what it looks like to practically have victory over sin in our lives. And that's where we're going to pick up this morning. And so if you'll read along with me in verse 11, it says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit, this is the obligation, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that we get to dwell on your truth and we get to see how to walk out in the victory that you have given us. We love you and we praise you and we pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul starts out in verse 11 by saying that we have the Holy Spirit. We as believers have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And not only that, but just as the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead, he will raise us, give life to our mortal bodies. 
And see, this is the key idea that he's getting at. The purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives is victory. There's many purposes, but one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is victory over sin. God's given him to us so that we can understand his truth, that we can figure out how to walk in obedience to him. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And not only that, not only is the Holy Spirit a way to experience victory over sin, it's the only way. Dwell on that for a minute. It's the only way. The only place where we can walk out in victory over sin is the Holy Spirit. Outside of the Holy Spirit, we have no power to kill sin in our own lives. Think about it. If we could, why did we need Christ to die? We could have just cleaned ourselves up if we had enough strength. But no, we needed to receive the Holy Spirit so that we can walk out in obedience to God. But if we look around, it's pretty evident that sometimes we don't really make this connection. We don't always act like this is the truth. An example of this would be how so many believers tend to think that they somehow need to repay the favor that Christ gave them on the cross. That they need to try and clean themselves up because Jesus was so good to me, so I need to, I need to try and be good for him. I gotta pull myself up by my bootstraps and I gotta, I gotta do this. They do all the right things, prayer, scripture memory, accountability, but it never actually lasts. And it never actually lasts because they're using the wrong tools for the job. Now listen with me. Self-discipline, prayer, scripture memory, accountability, they're all great things. But we have to realize that when those things are separated from the Holy Spirit, they're absolutely powerless. They're tools. They're not the means. There's actually a quote that says, trying to kill sin and behave morally through personal strength and efforts using personal tools and techniques is the foundation of all the false religion in the world. Listen, if your sanctification comes from your own strength, your religion's false. There's plenty of people out there trying to clean themselves up on their own. Plenty of faiths, plenty of self-help programs. Think of a Rubik's Cube with me, right? Those little squares. When I was a kid, I never knew how in the world people solve these things. I got one one time from like the Cracker Barrel old country store, you know, where you walk around while you're waiting to get your table. Like one person laughed, you got me. And I never knew how to solve these things. I'd sit there, fiddle with it. I even tried to like peel off the stickers or whatever. And it turns out that apparently there's a very specific pattern for how you're supposed to solve this Rubik's Cube. It's like an algorithm. You're supposed to turn it a certain way and do this many turns this way and this many turns that way. And that's how these people can solve it in like five seconds or crazy stuff like that. And see, if you don't know the right way to solve the Rubik's Cube, you might get lucky. You might be able to get a few colors grouped together. You might even get a side kind of grouped together. But you're never going to be able to reliably and completely solve that Rubik's Cube. If you don't go about solving it the right way, you're not going to be able to do it consistently. In the same way, if we don't go about killing sin the right way with the Holy Spirit, we're never going to have true victory. What ends up happening is we just end up getting rid of the fruit of the sin, not the root of the sin. We get rid of the actions, the visible outworkings, not the things that are deep down inside of us that are causing us to do those things. Our life simply consists of spiritual whack-a-mole. Ooh, finally got my drinking problem. Oh no, there's a pornography problem. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh, pride, pride, okay, I got that. Oh, now there's some greed. It never lasts. It never ends. It's just a cycle of going through and whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole. Pets in, pets in, pets in. But it always pops up again. We have to realize that our victory over sin is only found in the Holy Spirit. But, but listen, that does not mean that we are absent from the process of having victory over sin. In fact, Paul makes it clear in verse 12 that we have an obligation to intentionally use the Holy Spirit to put to death sin in our lives. And see, this is the ditch, in the, the ditch on the other side of the road that people usually fall into, right? Uh, it may sound something like this. Well, since it's only the Holy Spirit that can get rid of sin in my life, do I just kind of sit here and pray and hope God takes it away from me? Or, man, I, I don't know what Holy Spirit I got, but it must not be the same one that everyone else got because I'm, I'm not seeing this victory that everybody talks about. 
And let me tell you that neither one of those could be further from the truth. We have a role to play, and that role is to intentionally use the Spirit. Right? That, that is, and that's what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 4.22. He says that we should take off the old self and put on the new self. The onus is on us there. And it's not that we have this power to clean ourselves up, but we've been given the tools to use. It's only through those tools, the Holy Spirit, that we can get rid of sin, but we still have to use them. Or we still have to use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works with us and through us, not against us. And I still remember to this day when I first realized this truth. Um, I, was a, I was a student at um, Dallas Baptist University. Go Pats. Nobody knows who we are. It's cool. And I'd really begun to grow in my walk with the Lord. But man, I, I would get so frustrated because even though I would, I would grow in, in, in my time with the Lord and quiet times and, and being able to worship more focused and, and all sorts of things like that, I still struggled with the same old sins. I couldn't get rid of them. And I was involved in an awesome community of uh, believers at DBU, guys who would really push me towards the Lord. There was accountability, and I was transparent with them. And I always heard the same thing over and over and over again, that your victory comes from the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I would have that same thought that I kind of had, I, I talked about earlier in the message, that I was like, man, these guys make it seem so easy. I just, I can't get over this junk. And I almost got to a place where I thought that I had to stop trying because trying meant that I was trying to clean myself up and that was sinful and that was causing me to fall into more sin. I was just so confused and I I got to this point where I was about to just lose it. I just wanted to give up. And and I remember one night I was meeting with these guys and and one of them spoke up and I was talking to them about kind of my, my situation and where I was at. And he's like, Garrett, it's not that your effort is the problem. It's that you're putting your effort in the wrong place. I tried with all of my might, with all of the self-help I could think of, with all of the different um, tools that I had in my own power to kill my sin. And when I failed, I thought that I should have just given up. When in reality, the whole time, God simply wanted me to direct my efforts to him and let him do what only he can do. It was that simple the whole time. I just needed to realize that the answer wasn't to give up. It wasn't to try harder and work hard for Jesus, right? Rather, it was to just play my part in the process that God had designed. And this, mean, this meant actively using the Spirit to kill sin. And so I've used that term over and over again, and it begs the next question, how in the world do we actually do that, right? Like, what in the world does that mean? And we obviously need direction, right? If a seventh grader comes up to me and is like, Pastor Garrett, how do I stop lying all the time? I'm not going to be, Billy, that's a great question. Use the Holy Spirit. Go have fun with dodgeball. No, of course not, right? You have to get some some meat. And so what we're going to do is I want to give you a few easy handles and ways that we can use the Spirit to kill sin. It's not like this is a checklist of do this, do this, do this. It's just some things that we can do, some weapons in our arsenal against sin. And my hope is that we would leave to be able to use them in our battle with whatever that we struggle with. And so first, we have to take our thoughts captive. See, when we think of sin, we usually think of like these clear, demonstrable actions and acts and things that these big over outlandish things like adultery, murder, theft, things like that. And those are obviously sin. But when fighting sin, We need to use the Holy Spirit to fight it at the thought level. Track with me. And I'm not just making this up. James 1.14 says that each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. James is showing us that sin begins in our minds. It starts as a thought. And he tracks it all the way to death. I always tell young men that I counsel, I'm like, dude, if you're planning how you're going to sin already, it's too late. You've let it go too far. Because if we think about sin, it all starts in our mind. Adultery starts with a lustful thought, lustful glance. Murder with letting anger fester. Hatred with comparison. That's where it starts. 
So an example of this, or, or an illustration I like to give, is that <clears throat> when we used to have a, uh, when we lived in Red Oak, which is about 30 minutes south of Dallas, we were in a rent house. And when we moved into this rent house, there was a garden, and in this garden were a bunch of just ugly plants and this one little, like, just ugly bush that we really didn't like. But you know how it goes. You move in, you, you unpack all the boxes, and you don't want to mess with, like, landscaping right off the bat. And so we put it off and put it off and put it off. But we put it off so long that this bush was no longer a bush. It was more like a tree, and it had actually grown up under the house and gotten into the pipes. And so we're like, all right, we, we got to get rid of this thing, right? And so we tried to get it up with some shovels. We tried to get it up with our hands. Obviously, that's not working because this thing is massive. And then being of slight redneck heritage, we pulled our truck in the front yard, tied a chain around the ball hitch, ran it over to the bush, tied it around the bush, and was like, let's floor it and see what happens. And that went about as good as you'd expect. Spun the tires in the grass, digging out ruts. It's not going anywhere. I think this bush had roots that went from Dallas to Waco. Like, it was not coming up. And then we finally got it to come up, but then the tension in the chain whipped it into the back of the truck and scratched up all the paint. Mind you, this is my truck my parents were using, so I was thrilled. And see, we got it up, but if we would have gotten rid of that bush when we first noticed it, rather than waiting for it to get big and grow roots and actually have some physical damage, right? We waited till it actually grew into the pipes. If we had just gotten up in the first place, it would have been no big deal. Could have just bent over and... Instead, we let it take root and it became a huge ordeal and caused a lot more damage than it had to. In the same way, if we don't kill sin at the thought level, at the beginning, when we first are tempted, it just starts to take hold and get harder and harder to resist, harder and harder to get rid of. But look, I'm not saying that whenever you have a bad thought, you just plug your ears and go, ah, da, 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 I don't want to think about it, I don't want to think about it. That's using your own strength. We're talking about killing sin with the Spirit. And so how do you, how do you control your thoughts with the Holy Spirit? What we do is that when you identify a thought that you know is sinful, or is dragging you towards sin, or is a temptation, you first pray, and then you take that thought and counter it with the truth of God. Let me illustrate this. If you're walking along a path and someone crosses your path that uh, you find naturally attractive, and you notice that lust starts to creep in, the first thing you have to do is identify the lie. Okay, Satan wants me to think that this is somebody that this is just an object for, for my lustful desires that I can just use and not treat as a human being, you identify that lie. And then you counter it with God's truth. You're like, okay, I know what, what Satan is trying to tell me. I know what my flesh is wanting. But in reality, like that person's a child of God, created to glorify him. That person has a soul. And I should be more consul- concerned with that person's soul than with their body. And so see, now you move from just blocking out bad thoughts to taking those temptations, taking those sins, and destroying them with the truth of God. You're no longer kicking the can down the road, you're taking it off. You've ripped out the bush instead of letting it take deeper root. Secondly, how we use the Holy Spirit to kill sin is we have to set our affection on Christ, stir our affections for Christ. Let me explain what that means. If we're ever going to have lasting victory over sin, we have to learn this, guys. This means finding what sets us on fire for Jesus, what makes you passionate about God, what makes you want to chase after him, and leaning into that, doing more of that, meditating more on that. Colossians 3 says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For those paying attention, I went King James Version on you there. And it's easy to see the pitfalls of failing to turn our eyes to Jesus. An example of this, have you ever noticed that when people are trying to remove a bad habit or a bad tendency, they focus on the removal of something rather than forming something new that's good? Like they're trying to get rid of a bad habit rather than forming a new good one. The gym that we go to, there's this board um, that we use for kind of like nutrition goals, right? It was for 2021 nutrition goals. And everybody wrote down whatever their goal for the new year was. And all of them seem to have one thing in common. Get rid of something. 
right? Eat less sweets, drink less soda, watch less TV, eat less carbs. It's not just our gym. Look at all the major fad diets right now. Keto, get rid of carbs. Whole30, get rid of sugar. Paleo, get rid of fat. Vegan, get rid of animal products. By the way, any of you are vegan, mad respect. Don't know how you do it. And the thing is, these diets rarely bring success, sustainable success, because instead of developing new healthy habits, you just get rid of some old bad ones. And then when the framework of that diet goes away, you haven't actually learned how to walk out in a new healthy habit and you just revert back to the old bad ones. It's the same way with our sin. If we only focus on ridding ourselves of sin without filling the void that's created with God, it's just going to fill back up with more sin. Much like the whack-a-mole example I used earlier, sure, you might kick one or two bad habits, but there's no real path forward. You may have learned to deal with your pride, but you didn't learn how to live like Christ in all phases of life. So instead of bouncing from sin to sin, fill that void with scripture and truth from scripture, right? Remember, this is done in the spirit. This isn't just like finding some hobby that makes you happy. This is stirring your affections towards Jesus. A great example of this, the sermon series we're currently on, Every Spiritual Blessing. Pastor has been teaching about how in Christ we are chosen, adopted, redeemed. He's given us a purpose, an inheritance, and the seal of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but that gets me pretty pumped up for Jesus. That stirs my affection towards him. Looking back on my life, on where I used to be and where I am now, that stirs my affection. That makes me want to go run through a wall for God. If we set our minds on things that stir us up for Jesus, then sin's going to increasingly just become an afterthought because it can never compare with the fullness of God. What a rich truth this is, right? That God has given us the Holy Spirit for the purpose of victory over sin, that we have an obligation to intentionally use the Holy Spirit to kill that sin, And that we can practically do that in two ways, by taking our thoughts captive and setting our affections on Christ. And so I want to close with a story of a man named Nate Self. Nate Self was a West Point graduate, an army ranger. He fought in the famous Battle of Takur Gar, also called Battle at Roberts Ridge. The battle started on March 3rd, 2002, when a call came in to Nate Self's platoon um, that a Chinook helicopter had been downed on the mountain. Um, And this mountain happened to be an Al-Qaeda stronghold. And so they had to go in, and and their own helicopter ended up being shot down. They were ambushed on three sides. And to hear Nate recall it, he had to remember that he had to crawl over his own soldiers' bodies to get out of the helicopter. This firefight went on for 15 hours. It ended up being the uh, the battle that was had at most high altitude in military history for the United States. And with the help of the reinforcements, eventually these soldiers took out the enemy, but five soldiers from Nathan Self's platoon were killed. Obviously, this affected him greatly. Time went on, he continued to serve, but a few years later, he was on a separate tour in Afghanistan. And he ended up having these, uh, these nightmares, this paranoia, just this terrible dread. He couldn't escape what he had been, been through on that mountain. It eventually led to him leaving the military, coming back home to Texas to be with his family, but it didn't leave him. Though he was free from war, he still struggled with it. He didn't get to experience that freedom. He had PTSD, addiction. It started to spiral. Suicidal thoughts became something that he struggled with regularly, and that's not the end of his story, though. He recalls one day finally reaching for his Bible, and he said it was the first time in a year that I got my Bible out of my duffel bag. I finally told my wife about my experience of combat. I journaled to her and talked to her, and I found specific answers to my problems in the Bible every single day. Now, Nathan, he, that, that was a turning point in his life. He, he was a believer before he served, but those experiences had, had drug him away, and, and he got to experience the freedom that he had, had all along once he finally turned to God. And he now lives with his family and he serves in different programs 
and um, different um, organizations that help soldiers that struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder. And listen, I, I don't know if your struggle is like his. Obviously, that's a very extreme example. But I do know that a good number of us sitting in here this morning are probably still on that left side of the fish tank. I get it, I've been there. And so while, while your situation might not be the same as Captain Self, the freedom that he had access to and eventually was able to experience, that same freedom is available to you this morning. Right, we're about to have a time of worship and a time of response and man, if, if God has put something on your heart, if you've been sitting here and every single time I, I bring up the words killing sin, walking out of sin, that nasty old habit pops into your head. That one you've tried to get rid of time and time and time and time again. So many, this is the last time. So many, I'm never gonna do this again. So many, I'm gonna be better from here on out. Yet it's never worked. That doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the way that you live. That doesn't have to be the cycle that you're stuck in. There is freedom in Christ. There is freedom in using the Holy Spirit that lives in you already if you're a believer to walk out of that sin to experience the strength and power of the life that God has bought for us, that God has given us. And so this morning, if the Lord has been working on your heart, I, I don't know how that is, but I do know that when we hear the word of God that we're commanded to respond. We're commanded to respond. And so whatever God is doing, maybe you need to sit in your chair and pray. I'm gonna be down here and have ministers down here. If you need to talk to someone, pass right by me if you need to. Go just pray at the altar if that's what you need to do. I, I don't know. But I know that you should respond. Don't shove that prompting of the Holy Spirit deep down inside one more time. We're gonna pray and then let's stand, worship, and respond. God, we love you. Thank you so much that you have redeemed us. Thank you so much that you have given us a path out of our prison. You've already opened the door and then you tell us how we can walk out. Please help us to take hold of that truth this morning. God, we love you. I pray that as we worship, our hearts would be moved towards obedience to you, Lord God. We love you and we praise you. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.